Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as a social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders in the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series will discuss some forthcoming educational initiatives from the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Margie Luisias, who is chair of the DEI committee and has been very involved in this work throughout her career. Dr. Luisias is an allergist and immunologist at Brigham and Wingham Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, where she also serves many leadership roles, including as Director of Diversity and Inclusion in the Division of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and Assistant Program Director for Racial Justice and Equity in the Internal Medicine Residency Program. In her spare time, Dr. Luisias is also a clinician <laughs> and performs research in community-based interventions to reduce racial disparities in pediatric asthma. I, I mean, I could spend probably the entire session uh, just you know, talking about all of Dr. Luisia's accolades, but I think it, instead, if it's okay with our listeners, let's just learn from her instead. And with that, you know, Dr. Luisia, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here today. No, I think this is going to be a great conversation, and, and we're going to learn a lot more about these important new initiatives. But before we get into that, I, I'd really like to learn more about your own personal background and interests. And if you're willing, can you tell us about your work in both allergy and immunology, as well as in diversity, equity, and, and inclusion? And specifically, which door opened first for you in these realms, and when did these paths cross? Oh, thanks for opening with that. I would say my entry into this was really just a combination of my, of my different identities. You know, I am a first generation Haitian American. Um, you know, I uh, was raised in New York City by a, a single mother. And I would say really that those um, identi identities really culminated in a series of experiences that showed me, you know, what inequities were about <clears throat> and um, how, you know, what disparities were and just how what you were conceived in or continually exposed to really could affect your life trajectory. And um, it was really when I, you know, I got interested in allergy immunology actually a little later on in my residency um, career, but going into residency, I, you know, again, already had this passion of equity um, and knew that I wanted to be a physician that utilized um, my skill set to affect patients beyond that, you know, one-on-one -on -one level. I wanted to, you know, make change on a, you know, population level, and and it was really in residency where I, you know, fell in love with asthma and saw mm -hmm. that, you know, allergy immunology was gonna, you know, be the way for me to, to do that because where I trained actually there was a, you know, I was you know, like, training with patients out of the East Harlem in the Bronx, mm -hmm. um, and also a lot of patients in Manhattan and really just seeing, you know, disparities firsthand because at that point I thought that if I wanted to work in this inequity space that I needed to, you know, do work outside of America. Like I was at that point was really focused on doing global health. And it was really then when I saw, oh, wow, like there's a lot of domestic um, disparities and, and there's a lot of work to be done in our own backyard. And, um, you know, and I would say that was my entry way into, you know, seeing that there was an opportunity to combine these two areas. And uh, it was further nurtured and blossomed um, when I went to the Brigham for fellowship. Well, that's really interesting. You know, it, it's fast. It always fascinates me how, you know, you and I are both allergist immunologists. I also fell yeah. in love with asthma when I was a resident, but my mm -hmm. training in, you know, Columbus, Ohio in the Midwest, while I saw a diversity in regards to asthma, it's quite different than what you experienced. Right. And, and, you know, have you found that uh, as far as other leaders within DEI, do you, do you mostly come from similar backgrounds where it's more, you know, inner city or urban environments, or is there more of a hodgepodge in your, in your experience? Yeah, I would say so, you know, within the committee, within the quad AI or even just other spaces with that, where I work, you know, most of us who, you know, gravitate toward this work come from these areas or 
you know, um, or actually identify as being, you know, underrepresented, you know, mm-hmm. minorities. And so, you know, it, it makes sense. If you've had this lived experience, you want to then say, you know, be a part of that solution because you don't, you know, you want to be able to, um, you know, fix that because you, you've grown in that particular space. But there definitely are others who, you know, may not be, you know, underrepresented minorities or come from historically marginalized spaces who want to be in that space. And a lot of times it may be because of the different exposures they had in terms of childhood or where they lived or, or maybe just, you know, in terms of other training experiences and things like that. But majority of the time, you're right, it tends to be people who, um, you know, are, are part of the community that they want to serve. <laughs> they, are, mm-hmm. they, they grew up in those, those spaces. Yeah, we've had a lot of accomplished colleagues join us on the podcast over the last few years, and and every mm-hmm. one of them seemed to really squeeze thirty hours out of every twenty four hour day. <laughs> but my goodness, uh-huh. when I when I look through your CV and all the work you've done, you really seem like you have a lot on your plate. Um, and I'm sure you've learned some lessons in productivity and time management. Do you have any practical tips that you can share with us, or am I off base and every one of your days is just total chaos? <laughs> I hate chaos. It's definitely not um, daily chaos, but um, uh, I think, you know, what I've learned, you know, particularly with the pandemic is just being mindful of just like what I can and cannot control, right? Because it's just like, there's just so much you, you can't, you know, you can't control. And so I think just trying to just be more mindful of that um, helps me to, to stay focused. But one of the things, you know, just practically I do, I love my calendar and I, you know, everything that I need to do within the calendar or, you know, in my planner notebook, I actually, for my writing, I actually have accountability writing groups. And then, you know, outside of my professional life, you know, I delegate where I can, you know, my husband's also a physician. We have two young kids, you know, so, you know, I have a house, you know, I have someone that helps with the house and cleaning and we have an evening nanny, I online grocery shop or shop in general online a ton. Um, and I, you know, also to even be transparent, I recently got, um, a therapist about a year ago, um, mm. and just really in the setting of me recognizing just the role of my mental health and, in, in, in creating my happiness and keeping my mood good was just helpful to, for me to keep on, t- on, on track of everything. And just my, you know, working with my therapist and learning the, the four domains that I need to work on on a daily basis, you know, virtually, you know, physical work. Um, you know, psychological work and even social work or just looking in those different domains and making sure I do something daily within those areas. And, and honestly, I've noticed like any, anytime like a, one of those domains is flipping, I actually notice a difference in terms of like my output and, and how I am executing things that day. Hmm. Well, you know, going back to your, your use of a calendar, do you like schedule purposeful blocks where you have nothing on your schedule for, where you can either practice mindfulness oh, or, or whatever? Yeah, I do. Like I'll put workouts. Uh-huh. Yeah. To work out. yeah, definitely. I definitely would do that because otherwise it's just, you know, the time will go, the time will go and you'll just end up doing another thing related to work or something else. So definitely I do do that. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I'm similar. If it's not on my calendar, it's not going to happen. If it is on my calendar, it's going to happen. And you know, I've had, you know, like fellows in training or others say, why do you have like a, a workout or coffee break scheduled on your calendar? And say, <laughs> so I make sure it happens. So absolutely. So, yeah, interesting. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, how long have you been a member of the DEI committee within the academy? And what changes have you observed within this committee since you first joined? Yeah, no, good question. I was thinking about that. Um, I think like, probably since fellowship, like, I think, like, I may have gone, like, maybe once as a resident when I was still, you know, still trying to sort out allergy and immunology as a career, but definitely as a fellow, um, and I want to point out, too, that we haven't had a name change, too, so we don't mm. formally the committee on the underserved, and our name changed last year, um, but in terms of changes within the committee, I would say the theme is growth. You know, we've seen growth in membership. We've seen growth in the activities and accomplishments. Like I've been so impressed, you know, um, you know, being chair and even, you know, my, my time being um, vice chair by the commitment and output of our members, you know, to highlight, you know, you know uh, two things. We released an updated work group report on disparities. Um, we also, that was about two years ago now. Um, mm-hmm. We also put together a rostrum on the role of race and PFTs last year as well. Um, there's also been growth with the collaboration and networking within the Quad AI. You know, we're actually the first committee to have a cross-committee membership with the advocacy committee, and myself and Rosalind Hicks are actually um, liaisons. And our, our goal really with doing that is to ensure that equity is on the um, forefront of, you know, equity, um, excuse me, with the legislation that the uh, Quad AI supports. So it's been great. 
No, it sounds very progressive. Um, you, you also seem like someone who's used to asking some really hard and honest questions, and I'm sure that comes in, in your line of work quite frequently. But one that mm -hmm. I've heard I've heard from leaders in our specialty on a somewhat regular basis is basically, how can we get more individuals from diverse backgrounds interested in our specialty of allergy and immunology? Do you have any thoughts or tangible steps that we can all take to improve upon this? Um, yeah, no, definitely. I would say first off, like, I, I am into those hard and honest questions. I believe growth occurs with being uncomfortable. But um, I want to first highlight just why workforce diversity is important because mm -hmm. I think it's just, you know, not just in allergy, immunology, or in medicine, but across every single industry, workforce diversity is important. Um, there's actually well documented literature demonstrating its benefits. You know, for example, in the financial sector, when they you know, examine the gender and racial diversity of boards, they see that there's, you know, more, um, when there is, you know, more racial and um, gender diversity, there's more creativity, there's more innovation, there's more um, marketplace awareness, there's, um, you know, higher amounts of, um, you know, excuse me, there's a higher return on investment. There's also, you know, greater financial performance, for example, and there was actually a paper in 2019, you know, specifically looking at medicine and saw that team diversity was actually associated with improved clinical outcomes. But um, but in terms of the the you know how to do that those tangible steps, first off, I would say leadership, leadership, leadership really matters. You know, I think who's in charge, you know, of saying you know we need to we need to do this or who you know who you know thinking of my academic medicine for example, you know if we're going to use that as our example, you know our, you're thinking of your division chief, you're thinking of the person who's the head of the clinic. You're thinking of the, the chair, you know, of that particular department. That person needs to be very explicit about valuing diversity equity because, again, they're the person that creates the agenda. They set the tone for the organization. And they're also, hold, hold, you know, in charge of thinking about where the money's going as well. And mm -hmm. we want to make sure if that person, if that person, that, that leader is valuing it, then everyone else is going to honestly fall in line. And I think along with that, having someone who's dedicated to actually doing workforce diversity. Because a lot of times what will happen is that, you know, someone's tasked with this, but this is gonna be the additional job that they do, right? This is gonna be the thing you do after mm -hmm. your day job, you know, after clinic or after whatever else you're doing during the, during the day. And it, obviously you're not gonna be able to put energy and effort or good energy and effort, you know, into doing that. <clears throat> and, but in terms of best practices, there actually is literature just to support what works. I want us to think about immediate like short-term things we could do like medium term and maybe long term and and again you know looking at the my 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 roles you know since i'm mainly in this academic space um you know i'm going to be focusing maybe just the ways we could do it from a you know fellowship recruitment you know perspective and so what you could do practically is doing something called holistic review of mm -hmm. applications mm -hmm. okay so you're not screening out people according to their board scores or what school they went to or what lab or the number of publications, because those are actually measures of systemic advantage, you know, and what you're doing with holistic view specifically of your, those who are historically marginalized, you're actually reviewing them for characteristics and qualities that are in alignment with the mission of your organization. So for example, our, you know, for your, your, you know, for your division, for your fellowship, you're thinking, okay, do we want people who are going to be you know, innovators in medical education? You know, do we want people to go into private practice? Do we want people to be, you know, basic science researchers? And, and, and what you're gonna be doing is going through these applications looking for attributes that are in alignment with that. Um, and, and then, you know, and you're probably seeing that maybe in the personal statement or in their letters of recommendation or the activities that they participated in. Um, you wanna also have anti-racist or implicit bias trained for the interviewers. And then I'll, another thing that I think that we um, tend to forget about is that when you're recruiting, you know, think about recruitment, you want to also create an environment that retains. The, um, because again, you bring people there, but you don't want them to necessarily be in a hostile environment once they get mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think on top of that, creating a safe space will also allow more people who of diverse backgrounds to gravitate towards that space as well. And, you know, and again, creating that, you know, you could do that through several ways. I'm happy to get into that. But again, that I, the, the main point of that is just creating a, 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 an environment that's inclusive, anti-racist, and values diversity. Um, and, and did you want me to go into the medium term and, and long term, if I have time? 
Can you oh, I th yeah, I think that'd be fine. No, because I think what you're describing is extremely important mm -hmm. for all, all of us to hear and learn from. Mm -hmm. And I guess if mm -hmm. you could even touch upon, well, how do we how do we reach these folks in the first place? Uh, so once they have an interest in the specialty, I think that's these are important things to implement and, and consider. But, uh, you know, any thoughts on, you know, either outreach programs or other things that have proven to be yeah. effective to, to find them in the first place? No, I, I agree, because I think, you know, one of the things I've, even, I've, I've thought about, too, even in my role as chair and even in my other roles, you know, within the Brigham, is that people will be coming to me, you know, with interest, and I'm thinking, like, gosh, I, would, I wish I had the opportunity to offer you something to get you linked in, and, and I think what we do really, we, what we really need is investing more into the exposure throughout the pipeline, but particularly earlier on, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and, and really capitalizing on the idea that this exposure early on, even at high school or elementary school, is actually really going to be critical to really just making sure that people even know that medicine is an option, you know, because I think that's the first thing is just like knowing that becoming a physician is an option. And then, and then along with that, this particular field of allergy and immunology is an option because a lot of times people don't even realize, which, you know, again, think, thinking about our, 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 um, our population who was historically marginalized, this field of medicine, this is, you know, you don't see people who look like you, right? And so you're mm -hmm. thinking, okay, this is not for me. And so having the opportunity to see someone that looks like you in this field early will plant that seed of like, okay, I could do this. And then, you know, then set the, the child up for success. But then we have to also provide resources. So whether we're going to be offering a grant for them, you know, or some type of um, scholarship for them to participate in research. Again, this is not being free, because that's the other thing is like, we want to make sure that whatever we're supporting them to be engaged in is not going to be, you know, for just for them to just spend their free time doing this. We have to be, find, provide some type of financial support as well. Sure. Okay. Well, as chair of the DEI committee, you helped submit some proposals for a health equity series of webinars and workshops over the next couple of years. And we're going to discuss some of the logistics and details. But before we do that, can you give us the 30,000 foot view about why these are important topics for the academy to address? Sure. The DEI committee really values educating our colleagues because these topics, you know, that we're going to be going through equity, structural racism, justice, are really an integral component of improving health outcomes. That I think that sounds very important. <laughs> and and, and the first series is going to focus on the role of implicit bias in health disparities, workforce diversity in the workplace. And before we mm -hmm. get into the, the details about the first webinar, I, I'd like to you know really hear your perspective on some of these key topics. And if you're willing, I'm going to ask you the really basic question: What are implicit biases? Yes. So implicit biases are unconscious stereotypes that we have about others based upon how they look. So their skin color, for example, or their weight or their gender. And these biases affect the way we interact with people in a negative way, but also in a positive way. And so it affects the way you speak to people, what you may speak about with them, um, or the way you look at them, or the way you move your body in those interactions. Mm. Does everybody have implicit biases? And if so, why is it important for each of us to recognize what, what these are? Absolutely. We all have biases, unfortunately. It's just part of being human. Hmm. Um, but it's first a part, important for us to recognize that our biases, we have to recognize them because that's the only way we're going to work on them. You know, the first step is just acknowledging and being honest. Because, again, if you don't realize what's your issue, you're not going to have, you know, you don't, you don't know what to work on. Mm -hmm. And do these implicit biases only occur on the individual level, or are there examples where these can occur on the institution or contextual level as well? Interesting question. So technically, no. Um, implicit biases cannot occur on a institutional or contextual level because by definition, this term is referring to what happens between individuals. You know, it's uh -huh. a form of interpersonal racism. Mm -hmm. However, implicit biases of individuals will typically reflect the biases of their context. So for example, in America, you know, the anti-black biases that are typically present amongst many individuals reflects the U.S.'s um, past and present treatment of those who identify as black. I see. Okay. Well, and mm -hmm. along, along those lines, because I think, you know, in my experience in speaking with, with friends and colleagues on this, it, it sometimes it seems a little more abstract to some. Mm -hmm. So can you offer examples of how implicit biases can impact patient care, research, or even workplace interactions? Sure. I'm, my favorite example is actually 
um, not with an allergy and allergy, because actually there's actually a, a, a dearth of literature specifically to our field, but it was actually published in 2016 and was looking at the association between nonverbal communication during end of life discussions, mm-hmm. assimilated patients, and the race of the assimilated patients. And actually the, the um, participants in this, you know, um, in this study were, there's about 32 or so attending physicians, mostly white and uh, men. Um, and, they, and they were audio and video recorded during these, you know, um, simulated patient encounters that were, they pretty much all had the same prognosis in terms of, of their issues. And the authors ended up using this really, you know, created this innovative, like, nonverbal communication score and basically looked at measures like percentage of time that the um, clinicians had open body language, the amount of time, percent of time, excuse me, that they, you know, spent interacting with the patient or the surrogate the percentage of time non-diagnostically, excuse me, touching the patient and the distance from the patient. And they basically saw overall that the nonverbal communication scores were significantly lower with the black patients versus the white patients. And and you can imagine that nonverbal communication, you know, all these things they were measuring really affects the therapeutic relationship, right? Between Mm -hmm. the, you know, the patient or, you know, the surrogate with, with that clinician and allows that patient to trust you, to open up to you, to have confidence in your recommendations, for example. And so you could, you know, if we want to extrapolate to allergy immunology, that obviously would have an effect in thinking about, you know, when we're talking about stuff like skin testing, desensitization, you know, biologic treatments, or, you know, being a part of a clinical trial. Like if you're not able to induce that, you know, um, safe space for the patient, they're not going to want to, you know, continue on with whatever you want to recommend. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Well, what about in regards to research or, or amongst colleagues in the workplace? Yeah, so there is actually tremendous literature in that space. I would say um, the bias in regards to professional development and career advancement is probably one of the ones mm. that's the most interesting because they also include, you know, gender as well. Mm-hmm. And there's been, you know, work looking at, you know, just the language, for example, that we use in recommendation letters, you know, um, um, or even um, when we think about who's offered for, you know, promotions, for example, you know, particularly for leadership um, positions and seeing that it's less likely to be those who are identified as underrepresented minority or even women as well. Mm. Now, you've given us a great background in regards to what implicit biases are, some examples, mm-hmm. you know, the, the importance of, of addressing them. But can we actually change our own implicit biases? And if so, how do we accomplish that? <laughs> that's, that's like the million dollar question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's research obviously really lacking in this area. Um, but we can change it there. You know, they, you, you'll, you'll see stuff like de-biasing strategies, at least from what I've seen in the literature, more of it has been done out, you know, outside of medicine, for example. But what we have been able to see, at least within medicine, that interventions that are, 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 that are um, intended to help you be aware of your unconscious biases or that focus on improving a, a clinician's cultural competency tends to reduce um, implicit bias. But again, the data tends to be varied depending on the cohort you look at. And then um, in the space of, um, you know, um, another debiasing strategy, actually the, the space of workforce diversity has actually been looked at as a tool to actually reduce biases through a concept called intergroup contact. And the idea with intergroup contact is that the more contact you have with individuals of the group that you have biases against, uh. the more you may learn that your stereotypes do not hold. You know, that's fascinating. Isn't that interesting? It yeah. is. I, I've read some some really um, great examples of how uh, like white supremacists um, mm-hmm. who were who were targeting uh, African American individuals that you know through various approaches they actually reached out and they became friends over time mm-hmm. and and they mm-hmm. changed their views or anti semitism and things like that. So I, yeah, that it's just it's a striking example of that. But that makes sense of just if you've you know never walked a thousand miles in somebody else's shoes and how can you relate Absolutely. to them and once you get to know them. Well, you you know you shared some some personal some personal information earlier, so if it's okay, I'm going to share a little bit on, on my own implicit biases. And you know, I work in Central Ohio, and many of our patients come from these rural backgrounds, and they drive quite some ways to come see us uh, for patient mm-hmm. care. And in learning about my own implicit biases, I recognize that I naturally was attributing lower intelligence or even lower health literacy to people who spoke with a southern or rural accent. It was a, it was a natural inclination that I had, um, which is a form I've learned is called accent. Bias. Uh, I mm-hmm. continue to work on this, and along with many of my other implicit biases. Um, but would you be willing to share something that you've learned about your own implicit biases through your work in this area? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, 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 no. no, no. I mean, I learned um, that I have an affinity bias, 
And, and I think it's really learned about this through like just the sheer amount of interviewing that I've had to do in both of my positions. But it, and what, what that is is basically the tendency to seek out and warm up to people who are like me. Uh, and, and so the approach to, to just, you know, helping with, you know, implicit bias during, you know, interviewing just naturally helps this, thank God. But, it's, you know, when you use standardized questions um, and having a scored rubric that allows you just to, you know, stay on track in terms of like <laughs> what you're trying to get. But mm-hmm. that was interesting for me to learn that about myself. No, it's interesting. Well, I definitely have that as well and <laughs> work on that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's, um, and I hear you. And, you know, I think one of the arguments in this area is always, well, don't we all have that? Or it just seems natural or that's what it is to be a human. And of course it is, but that's the importance of, of recognizing it. But I've Absolutely. learned when I, when somebody is just so different than I am to, to seek out, um, the differences and, and ask them about some of these these things, whether it's their natural proclivity towards certain things that they enjoy or just their approach to, to different things. And I learned so much from them and it's been very enlightening for me whenever I, I might come across that. Mm-hmm. So what about explicit biases? What, what are these and how do they differ from implicit biases? Yeah, so explicit biases are also interpersonal. So they're, you know, a bias that will occur between people, but they are not unconscious. So a person is actually aware other biases and will communicate them openly openly so it will be like for example like an overt racism or mm-hmm. a, a racist comment that will happen okay um so that sounds like it's you know and what do those people sort of respond to the same understanding and feedback of, of as those who have implicit biases it seems like to me that if somebody's explicitly doing this that it might be a little bit you know harder to get through to them has the the research found yeah. that yeah, you know, I guess that's an area that I'm, I, I haven't gone that much into in terms of looking at how do you tackle those people who are a little bit more, imagine <laughs> a little bit, who tend to be, you know, who are overt uh, mm-hmm. about their racism. So I'm not sure. But I could imagine that, you know, you, there may be a, maybe thinking about mag- microaggressions. The microaggressions, a person may be more aware of their comments, but not necessarily realizing that they're bad, you know. Um, and 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 not understanding that maybe because their lack of exposure to different people that what they're saying is actually a negative thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, it's interesting you mentioned. I was I was going to ask you about that um, because mm-hmm. I do a lot of work on social media, and I'm mm-hmm. um, I continue to learn more about how each of us really is living in our own highly curated uh, alternate mm-hmm. reality. <laughs> you, you yeah. Take, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's true. it's something. You, you take the same information, but. Um, various people can look at it through their own lens and they can, you know, interpret it very differently and, and, to, and their lives can be impacted very differently by that. So along those lines, I wanted to ask about microaggressions because I think it falls within a similar realm of people either, they may not even realize they may be doing this. So can you tell us a little bit more right. about what microaggressions are and offer some examples? Yeah, no, microaggressions are, even though, you know, micro is in them, they're definitely, um, you know, not benign, but they're defined as everyday, subtle, intentional or unintentional interactions or behaviors that communicate some sort of bias towards a historically marginalized group. And, and so they, therefore they could be explicit, like I was mentioning before, but can be implicit as well. As well. And, and, and the, the way you want to think about them is that there's everyday ways in, in terms in ways people of color can be made to feel unwelcome or unsafe in their, mm. in their settings. And, right. um, I, oh, sorry, I was gonna mention examples. Oh yes, please. Uh, yeah, so in, so I would say, you know, an example would be, let's say, like, you assume someone who's foreign and, and born, and then when they start speaking in English, you comment on how well they speak English. Oh. Or with myself, for example, you know, being a Black woman with, you know, kinky textured hair, mm-hmm. you know, um, sometimes when I straighten my hair, well, actually, I don't do it now, but there was a time when I would do it, do it more regularly, I would get comments from colleagues or even from patients, like, oh my gosh, I love your hair that way, like, you look better that way, and I would be like, you know, again, they're well-intentioned, telling me I look great, which is, you know, good and, and well, but again, this is, you know, a subtle way, for, you know, of also saying, you know, we prefer you in a way that is conforming to what society says is beautiful, you know, having straight hair. Absolutely. My my eyes were open to that phenomenon years ago. I, I, I mm-hmm. teach a course at the medical school on social media for medical professionals. And one of the students, um, that was her focus because she was saying that her interactions with patients 
differed by the way that she wore her hair that day. Absolutely. And, yep. and that it, you know, it takes hours to, to get her hair, um, you know, ready in the morning and things like that. And she actually took that to, to Instagram and did a wonderful job just kind of telling the world mm. and using that platform about, you know, why this is such an important thing to recognize and how it negatively impacts her <laughs> daily interactions. It was yep. so fascinating. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Good for her for having the courage yeah. to do that. Yes, that was a big part of it. You're absolutely right. Um, yeah, thanks mm -hmm. for mentioning that. Well, okay, you've given us this fantastic background on these very important topics, uh, as well as how the Academy is getting more involved in your work on the committee. So can you tell us now you know, what's been planned in regard to the first webinar and then what comes next in Series 1? Yes, yeah, so for the first webinar, our goal for that one is going to be um, understanding the differences between implicit and explicit biases, you know, what we've been talking about, and then also including some de-biasing strategies on the individual and institutional slash contextual levels. And we're actually going to have Dr. Jessica Insum, um, who is a, you know, board-certified community um, psychiatrist, you know, at, um, at Yale. Um, she also is the founder of Vision for Equity that does, does a lot of work um, um, with um, different organizations. So we're really excited to have her come to, to do this work with us. So when does the first webinar come out? So the, actually the first webinar is January 19th, Thursday. Okay, excellent. And uh, for our listeners, uh, the Academy is going to do a great job in regards to email blasts. You'll be able to see information on social media as well as on, on the website as well. And then uh, are there other webinars planned after that one or uh, are you yes. able to divulge what comes next? Yes, I can. So for, for this academic year, we actually have two more webinars planned. Mm. For webinar number two, we're going to be looking at the role of implicit bias in workforce diversity in medicine and research. Uh, so we're specifically looking at, you know, the, in the setting of recruitment. And then for the third workshop, I'm actually super excited for that one. That's actually going to be looking at um, microaggressions and, and you're, mm -hmm. it's actually going to be um, inter interactive and you're going to learn how to go from uh, being a bystander to an upstander. Um, I actually participated in that in my um, institution, so I'm excited for that. And then for the next academic year, our series, we actually going to have three webinars again. And that is going to, and I don't necessarily have to go into detail, so I don't want to you know, leave um, the audience, you know, in suspense for that, but it's going to be <laughs> focusing on um, how there is no quality without equity, the integration of equity in emerging health innovation strategies. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, perhaps we can have you back, or actually, are you done as your term, in your term as chair of the committee? Do you transfer over at the annual meeting, or do you have one? Yes, I transfer over, yep. But, you know, we, we still still tend, tend to hang around a little bit just to support mm -hmm. the, the chair, so I'll still be around, definitely. Okay. All right. Well, excellent. Well, you've been very helpful, and you've answered some challenging questions for us, but if you're okay with it, I do have one more. Um, mm -hmm. And like many of our colleagues, I have participated in learning modules on implicit bias mandated for my institution. And I've actually found many of them to be quite useful. I think they do a nice job and they've evolved as opposed to the, the more passive learning style to get people involved in thinking about their own implicit biases. But some of them are still, you know, have the work to be done. But what do you say to someone who doesn't recognize the importance of this topic or who feels like these modules are a waste of time? Mm, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I feel like at this point in time, given what we've gone through um, mm -hmm. in our country, what we've been exposed to, I, I would just say, okay, you have the free will to say no and, and think this is a waste of time. Because what I've learned over time is that you can't force people, right? You can't, you mm -hmm. know, people are going to have their experiences and thoughts. Um, but I would follow up with the question of, of Jane Elliott, who's an anti-racism activist and educator, who in her teachings will pose this question, and I'll paraphrase here. She says, you know, would you be happy to be treated in society in general the way our society treats black people? Mm. You know, uh, and hoping that will then lead to some honest conversations about how, you know, are these modules truly a waste of time or not? But I mean, uh, another way I could see maybe that person saying that is that maybe they feel like there's nothing to gain, you know, maybe from the modules mm -hmm. or maybe it won't change anything really. Um, but I think that this will also hopefully lead to a conversation about just still recognizing how step one of change is recognizing your bias to begin with and how that's a cr critical first step of reducing because you can't approve upon, you know, something that you're not aware of. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Well, the 2023 annual meeting is rapidly approaching. Are there any sessions on this topic or similar topics that you're aware of that you'd like to highlight? Yes. I mean, there's so many, but yes, I want to highlight. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to highlight, so at the Program Directors Assembly, there's actually going to be a talk on integrating um, disparities into fellowship 
um, educational curriculums. And so that should be exciting for the program directors out there. Friday, there's actually um, a, a workshop that I'm, I'm participating in called Practical Applications to Addressing Disparities and Equities in the Clinical Setting. Then I want to highlight another one that I'm going to be moderating on Sunday, um, Community Level Environment and Rates and Risk Factors for Early Life Viral Infections, and then mm -hmm. the pre-recorded sessions. There's at least about three. Okay. So that are, are there. So definitely lots lots of content. <laughs> yes, that's that's fantastic. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time for this episode, but I, I would love to have you return in the future to discuss more about your, your personal research and, and interest in addressing racial disparities uh, in regards to pediatric asthma. But in the meantime, can you tell us what you love most about the work that you do? Mm, uh, I love that my work aligns with my purpose and my passion. You know, every day, whether I am taking care of patients, working with residents and fellows, doing recruitment retention and efforts, recruiting patients for studies, everything aligns with my gifts, my talents, my abilities, and I feel extremely blessed <laughs> to be in this position. No, oh, that's great. I think it's so important to find meaning in the work that we do. Well, mm -hmm. and then one last question, and I've asked variations of this to prior guests as well. All mm -hmm. right. If you could have one message that was placed on a hot air balloon or a blimp, something very big that would be seen by as many pieces as many people as possible, what would mm -hmm. your message be and why? Uh, do not be afraid to be you. Do not be afraid to be you. Okay, can you give us some some insight as to why you choose that? And I and I've been thinking about this because of, you know probably because I'm in the midst of residency recruitment, <laughs> but <laughs> I think with um because medicine, I think the journey a lot of times, particularly in the in the beginning part, grooms you to be a certain type of person, and and makes you sometimes forget your why and and makes you conform to a certain type of person that may not really be in alignment with who you are. And, and sometimes we're afraid to be that person, you know, because medicine doesn't really support that individuality. And so, and I think that's boring, right? And I also think like if we're trying to make change and be innovative, like you have to, you know, embrace who you are and be not afraid of making change and, and, and you know, and, and disrupt it, right? And so I think just embracing that, you know, individuality, and, you know, will, will, is, is important. I think that's great. And you know, it's interesting. So it, it, it was, do not be afraid to be you. I, yeah. I bet you if we took a hundred of our colleagues or a hundred people out in the world, uh, they would all have a very different interpretation of that. I love it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, Dr. Luis Cias, this has been very useful, and I can't wait for the webinar series and all the other work that um, you and uh, members of the DEI committee have been have been putting forth in, in regards to help improve awareness and education on these very important topics. I truly appreciate you taking the time to join us. Do you have any last words that you'd like to share before we depart? Of course. Thanks again for having me. It's been a pleasure. Um, but I would say for the listeners, recognizing that we all have skin in a game in regards to achieving equity and justice in medicine. I, I really want the li listeners to challenge themselves to reimagine racial equity and justice being an integral part of the conduct and the execution of effective clinical medicine on the individual patient level, um, but also on the population level for all of us who are clinicians, and, and that we need to think about this even in, in the research we're conducting. I'm thinking about your other episodes on, on you know, that were with you know, Dr. Perry, Dr. Davis, and Dr. Israel, you know, and, and with mine, you know, really thinking about how we all can contribute to this, and it's, and it's really important for us to all appreciate that. Mm. Well, thank you again. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Please visit www.aaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.